Well, to me, it's a tremendous honor. I mean, you know, it's only been given once before, and that was given to the people who developed the Internet and the World Wide Web and the computer browsers. And, I mean, so, you know, that's a pretty nice company to be, uh, you know, to have. But tell us, what, what are medical release systems? I mean, and how important are they? Well, medical release systems, I mean, there, there are whole ranges of them, you know, and we probably take them all the time. Some are, are pills that last a long time. Some are transdermal patches yeah. that you put on. We've, also, we've done a lot with uh, injectable and implantable systems, like little microspheres that, you know, t you could put a drug in, which normally would be destroyed right away, and it can allow it to last for. And why is it important that the medicine is released over a period of time? Well, some, some of these medicines, if you don't release them over a period of time, they're destroyed actually in seconds. So let's say you took a, a, a peptide or a fairly large molecule. You, you actually can't swallow that. You can't uh, put it in a patch. It's too big to go through the skin. If you inject it, it's destroyed immediately. So, you know, you can't inject yourself every, every couple seconds. So, so that, that's why it's important. It makes, the, it makes the use of these practical. It also tremendously improves... Uh, patient compliance. I mean, sometimes there are people who are mentally ill, have diseases like schizophrenia, and, and so there are some of these treatments, you know, they're, they help people. I mean, you don't have to remember to take them. And you've pioneered the use of materials, of, of polymers, haven't you? I mean, to what extent have you worked, sometimes in the face of, of opposition, have you challenged the status quo? And has, no. how has that affected your work? Well, when I was much younger, um, you know, I started doing some of this work in the 70s, and, and then what was conventional wisdom was that certain types of substances that were particularly fairly large couldn't pass through some of these plastics we, we and others were designing any more than, say, any of us could walk through a brick wall. And so when we published some papers, actually in Nature, British Journal, uh, that you could do this, it met with a lot of skepticism from chemists and engineers because it didn't seem like that could happen. And that was hard. I, my first nine research grants were turned down, and even at MIT, where I'm a professor, they, um, you know, the department head who hired me left a year after he came, and a couple of the associate department heads decided to give me some advice. You know, their advice was I should start looking for another job. One of the things you involved with that you developed was gecko tape. Tell, tell us oh, about yeah. gecko tape. Well, that's interesting. And Jeff Karp, who was uh, one of my uh, postdocs and now professor at Harvard, and I, we uh, wanted to mimic with the plastic what happens with a gecko. So you could get... A lizard when it's... E exactly. Yeah. So that you could get very high adhesivity. So that it's kind of almost... A and this is actually tape that you could use inside the body to repair or stick onto slippery organs. As it well, was. that's correct. I mean, we're, we're not... So, again, I, the only contrast I'd make is a lot of the con polymer systems that I mentioned are already very widely used. This is still experimental, so, you know, it's not something you can go and buy yet. But someday... I, I believe it will, and it could be a whole new kind of medical adhesive, you're right. And as we said in our introduction, it's been estimated that you've managed to help about two billion people. I mean, that's an enormous achievement. To what extent does that motivate you, or is it all about the science for you, you're just fascinated by the engineering of it, or does that motivate you, the, the idea of yeah. helping people? Well, no, the, the reason I went into medical research and chemical, re, you know, combining chemistry and medicine and chemical engineering in the first place was because I wanted to help people. I mean, I originally, the, the, some of the offers I got were actually to go in the oil industry and things like that, and I, I wasn't as excited about that. I really wanted to see if I could use my chemical engineering background to do something, whether it be education or, or, or medicine or something, that would help people. I didn't know exactly what I would do, but the idea that I could use science and engineering to help people, that means a lot to me. Now, we've had a, a case today uh, in Britain about uh, triple DNA, using DNA from three parents. Uh, and, of course, stem cells again. Right. Britain was ahead of the United States. I mean, when you're at the frontiers, uh, is Britain a good place to work because we're more open, perhaps, than even the United States and some? Well, I, I think Britain's certainly a good place to work. I know, I know quite a few of the British universities and a number of my students are professors at them, and uh, they've done great. So I think, I mean, I think both Britain and the United States are, are, are good places to work. I mean, I think the biggest issue for both right now is, you know, decrease in federal funding because you really want to support basic research in engineering and basic research in science. But both Britain and the United States, I mean, the work is, is terrific. And certainly in the areas you mentioned, well, Britain's done wonderful But work. what about it? I mean, do you, do you think it's the right thing to do what some people call sort of Frankenstein science and engineering, bringing together three parents to create one child, for example? Well, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not an expert in that particular area, but I don't think of it that way. I mean, the way I understand it is what they're trying to do is just increase the safety 
of, of a procedure that's already being used. I mean, in other words, my feeling is, from, from what I've read, yeah. is that people, when they get the conventional procedure... They need mitochondria DNA from a third source. Right, basically. right, exactly. But I think the intent of doing that is so that people wouldn't get muscular dystrophy sure. or diseases like that. And, again, what, we, what I, I think you certainly don't want to do Frankenstein science, but you do want to... You, you, you do want healthy children, you do want healthy adults, and, and so I think whatever we can do to relieve suffering, I mean, I think we do want to do that. And Lord Brown, who, who helped found this Queen Elizabeth Prize, felt that engineering was a bit of a Cinderella in contrast to pure science. Do you think it is now uh, getting the credit it deserves? Well, I think I'd like to see engineering get more and more credit. I think there's just wonderful engineers all around the world doing fantastic things. I, I, I think there's also wonderful scientists around the world doing fantastic things. So I, I, I think that what any society gets is what it celebrates. Yeah. Right now, since we talk about Nobel Prize winners, now we talk about QE2 Prize winners. Yeah. No, well, that's true. But I would say whether it's Nobel Prize or QE2 Prize winners, neither of them gets the attention that an athlete or a movie star gets. And, 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 and I think all these things are important to okay. encourage young people. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Congratulations. <laughs> okay.